Hallelujah. So a few days back, uh, two things kind of kind of occurred. One was that uh, I want to say it's exactly Monday uh, of last week. The church as a whole, Crossway Ministry, started a church fast. <clears throat> And so I thought uh, it was on my heart of my fasting period, maybe not necessarily yours, but there's somebody in here that has the same thing, very same message in their heart. That as this fast started uh, on a Monday, it was a very challenging fast for me. Day, day one from the very beginning, it's just like everything was coming against me and my spirit was vexed. And I cried out. And I started wondering why. What is it, Lord God? What is it that's in me as a man? What's, what's bothered me? Why well, have previous fasts seem not to have followed me. We're on the first day of the fast and hunger pains are in my stomach and thoughts are in my thinking that shouldn't be there and I prayed and prayed and I wondered and I thought about other people in this sanctuary, those that are here tonight and maybe they were here Sunday but I started thinking was there other people having a difficult first day or maybe a difficult second day. But as the days progress, the struggle of the fast from a physical sense because we struggle because our body wants food and nourishment and calories and you start thinking about this period of time that we're in, especially for people that from Louisiana, it's crawfish season, right? And, and, and I'm not going to get a hand raise on how many people like crawfish, but probably easy uh, number would be the majority. And so these challenges that as we started this fast started to enter into my heart. Now, I remember coming here one night, uh, and it wasn't a prayer night, but I came here and, and just prayed and said, Lord, I'm challenged. Here we are, day, I believe it's day three. And Lord, I'm challenged. And so since I was challenged, I wondered, was there other people? And certainly there has to be other people. Uh, people like to eat. But then I thought, why? Why do we fast? And that started coming into my heart. And I prayed over it and prayed over it. And sometimes it seems like, you pray and you cry and you plead with God to unveil heaven to you of what's going on within the eternal part of your body, your soul, your spirit. And so then some scriptures started coming to life. And at first, uh, this is actually going to be a little different because uh, when I wrote this, most books or things that are written start moving from right, moving that direction. And so as I wrote some of this stuff, and actually it was just a few hours ago, actually God said I'll start from the back direction. And so I'm actually going to have to turn back in order to close this out. And uh, you got, you got, okay. You got, uh, what did we get out of here, 10? <laughs> okay. So uh, I want to share. Word, Hallelujah. Yeah, we need the word. I want to uh, share some stuff with you. And I do got to put my glasses on. I uh, never thought about that. Something just entered my heart was, have you prayed about your eyesight? <laughs> but, uh, in the meantime, I need to, but right for now, if I don't put on my glasses, I'm certainly not going to be able to read anything. And so this, uh, and I'm not sure if you would call it exactly a message or a teaching or a testimony, maybe the combination of the three, 
But this actually starts and it kind of piggybacks on a message that Pastor Matt recently uh, started on and had preached a little bit about uh, and Ezra and Nehemiah. And so I had read some in Ezra and uh, I found that there was an event that took place in Ezra and it actually starts about chapter eight of Ezra and it unfolds in verse 21 and 22 and 23 pertaining to the fast. So a little bit of history about Ezra and, and really I'm not trying to give a historical viewpoint of it, but just trying to move us from where we're at in this fast and trying to move us in comparison to the children of Israel and what was going on. And so we see in the first verse, I'm trying to see what's better, the small the print on my Bible, the, uh, fortunately, I also uh, printed, wrote it, handwritten it, and it's even bigger, but I'm going to try to uh, read from here. And so we're in verse 1. These are now the chiefs of their fathers, and this is a genealogy of them that went up with me from Babylon in the strength of, okay, I'm gonna, I might struggle with this name, but I'm going to give it my best shot, okay? Air top chefs. Artaxerxes. Okay. I, I knew somebody in here with their, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not going to read the other names going down. There's so many names there. And, and from time to time, when I've run across a lot of times I use Blue Letter Bible and press that little button there and it pronunciates it for you, right? And it makes it a little bit more smoother. And then at my age at 64, three days later, it's like, what exactly was that name again? And so we find that the king, at this period of time, that he's involved with Ezra, and this king actually in the sense of identifying as a, uh, a good king, we have to say that there is goodness within this king's heart. And it's going to unfold slowly. And, I'm not, and really, I, I'm, like I said, I don't want to do too much of the history, but I wrote a little bit down that I'd like to share with you. So the beginning of Ezra 8 basically identifies the genealogy of those who returned with Ezra from Babylon and they were heading back to Jerusalem. And so they're on this mission to rebuild. Scripture records, and if you do the math of it, and I did what I consider simple math, and I came up with right under a little bit of 1,500 men in this particular remnants that are leaving Babylon and they're heading to Jerusalem. And so when you try to do the simple math of, okay, if there was 1,500 men, how many women were there and how many children? And I actually Googled that and, I, and I've seen different numbers. I've seen as much as 5,000 and I've seen as much as 7,000. And I don't know if there's any real way other than saying each man had a wife and were these men men of war, which I don't think they were. So men of war might have been a little bit older. They might have been married. Anyhow, so we, we kind of leave it with somewhere around that amount of persons. And so this journey from Babylon to Jerusalem was approximately 1,200 miles. And I thought about that. 1,200 miles that this group of men and women and children, and we have to go ahead and use some deduction and say there was babies that were walking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so this journey was a long journey. And I thought, well, how many miles 
can a individual walk in a given period? Unfortunately, I have, in this, I've tried not to get too analytical because this would be presented completely different. So I tried not to get too analytical, but my mind thought, how many miles could a, a group of people walk in a given day, and how long was a given day? And then I start thinking of historically a little bit about time, sunset, sunrise, and thought, well, did they walk at night? Well, they probably had to set up tents so they could get some rest. And so I kind of came up with some time periods and said, well, probably about 10 to 12 miles in a given day. And so this uh, journey actually took about four months on this journey. Wow. And this group was carrying a large amount of treasures. And it's recorded that they had a lot of silver and gold that this king had actually gave to them. And so they're carrying this, these treasures and this volume of food for this journey. And so they had a lot on their plate. I read a number of about $5 million. And this money was being dedicated, and that's why I say the king was a good, definitely was a good king. God moved upon his, his heart. So this money was being dedicated and brought with them with provisions so they could go and help rebuild the final structure and put stuff in. So about $5 million, and that's a lot of money. Uh, maybe not in today's term. And so as they travel down these rocky terrains, and it wasn't like today when we travel that we get in our vehicle or maybe we walk or we ride a bicycle or maybe we even take a plane, but we start thinking about 1,200 miles, 1,200 miles. Imagine that all of us together we decide that we're going to go preach the gospel somewhere and we're traveling 1,200 miles as a group. And then I started thinking about, okay, the, uh, the hot, and I'm thinking right now, present tense, you know, we have uh, McDonald's we can stop at and Burger King we can stop at and probably hotels we can stop at, but they didn't have that. That's right. They didn't have none of that. There was no McDonald's, no Burger Kings. There was not going to be any crawfish boils. None of this was going to occur. And they were traveling some, through some very hostile territory that there was people that didn't have the goodwill. And let's just say that they were armed bandits. They were bad people that when people traveled long distance, that they would attack them that they would rob them, that they would kill them, that the, the provisions would be taken from these people and put into their own loot bag. They would keep it for themselves. And so Ezra had all this on his plate as he was bringing the people there. <clears throat> these armed bandits of thieves. Traveling with women and children, which didn't really give from a man perspective when he has a wife and he has children, especially young young babies that are still still being held. And I was looking for Brennan because Brennan has a young daughter today, and I was thinking about that. There he is back there. And so you have to bring your children and the ability for a man to flee and to run away is one story versus his wife because he's called to protect her and take care of her. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord God, that you put that in my heart, Lord God, for a reason. Thank you, Lord. You're called to protect and provide and look after your, your household, your wife, your children. Hallelujah. And so they could readily just flee and run away. So the wise thing, and, I, and I'm thinking from an analytical side, that the wise thing, if I was Ezra, I would have thought about this king that gave me financial resources and provisions to bring with me. 
I, I would have thought about maybe, uh, maybe I get this king to send me a group of soldiers that would help defend us and watch over us as we made this journey. But Ezra, being a man of God, not only a man of God, but the Bible records actually that he was a priest and he was a scribe of the law of God. And so we start thinking what biblical books were in existence in that era time. And, and for certain, the uh, people would have had the Torah, the five first books of, of the Bible. And certainly him being a man of the law that and a scribe and a priest he would have read. And, and all evidence in scripture all indicates all them to be very, very true and accurate. And so he would have understood the greatness of God, the things that God did for the people of the past, and now he's got his people that he's bringing with him. And Ezra would have knew that when Moses traveled, that the sea was parted. He would have knew about Joshua and the river that was open. So he would have knew all this stuff. And certainly as he talked to the king, this is in his heart. And it lives in his thoughts. And certainly he's going to tell the king in his thinking, it's like, you know what, let me tell you something about what God did. Hallelujah. What God did for the people. Hallelujah. How many people here can say, hallelujah, God has done this for me? Yes. Hallelujah. And so there's people that I look across and I think, wow, probably every single person has a great testimony. And that testimony is going to be given, hallelujah, given by each and every person, Lord God. That their testimony that lives in the contents of their heart one day will be spoken out. Yes. Spoken into existence. And these stories and these testimonies that live in people, what God has done for us, hallelujah, will be manifested orally, verbally. And it's going to permeate the sanctuary. Permeate the sanctuary. And other people are going to hear it. And other people are going to tell your story. Yes. And your story. Yes. Hallelujah. And so Ezra kind of put himself in somewhat what I would consider after you read some of a Position, and some people could say, well, it was a disposition. And I guess in some sense you might look at it as a disposition. But when you read God's word and it lives in your heart, truly lives in the depth of your soul, Hallelujah. and all you do is think about it, that when the morning time, when you wake up, that your eyes open, that you start thinking about God. Yes. Hallelujah. You start thinking that your brain, before that cup of coffee, and some people may, some of you might not, yes. but you start thinking about God and the graciousness and the mercy and the grace that he's provided to you. Hallelujah. When you start thinking about it, the heavens change things in your life when they open up. Hallelujah. Yes. So when we think about it, Ezra certainly gave thought to it, and now he had to articulate it to the king and take a back seat and say, you know what? I'm not worried about the robbers. I'm not worried about the travel and the journey. Yes, it's going to be tough. Yes, it's going to be tough. Hallelujah. Life has some tough roads. Hallelujah. We travel tough roads. Yes. Hallelujah. It's going to be tough but you know what? I believe in God. How many people here?
believe yes. in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Certainly we believe in God. It's a Wednesday night, right? And here people are yes. in this sanctuary, right? Yes. Yes. We, we come here and we lift up our voices yes. and we praise Him, Lord God. We pray over people. Hallelujah. Yes. There's a movement of God happening here. Hallelujah. Yes. A movement of God. And we see it and we feel it in our spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we feel it in our spirit. Yes, Lord. And so Ezra kind of took and said, you know what? I'm going to believe God. And God is going to guide us and protect us, right? Protection. <clears throat> and actually, when you read that uh, verse, uh, excuse me, verse 21, and I'm going to read it for you. Then I proclaim a fast at the river of Ahava. Okay, nobody said anything. I guess I said that right. Okay. That we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all. All our substance. Praise God. And so when we look at this word that's called afflict, the word, the application of the word is to, to humble ourselves. And so when I start thinking about humbling ourselves, I thought I think maybe about on my knees, that I'm praying, that I'm seeking God. That all external influences that are trying to come in into my thinking process. I think about as uh, some of the scripture that Pastor Mac had up, humbling ourselves and not exalting ourselves. Yes. Hallelujah. And then in verse 22, and this is where Ezra kind of substantiates some of the stuff that I was, I was speaking out. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king saying the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. Thank you, Lord God, that we seek your face, Lord God, that your wrath, Lord God, is not upon us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then in verse 23, so we fasted and we sought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Hallelujah, entreated of us. So they fasted, and they sought God. And so when I think of that, I think, well, during my fast, Lord God, I need to be consciously aware that I need to put time, spiritual discipline into my life spiritual discipline. And so when we think about the word discipline, and I do sometimes think about the word discipline, and I think about maybe from a from my, my dad, my biological dad, that he would discipline me when I did things wrong. Hallelujah. And so when I think about a from a disciplined perspective, I think that we have to discipline ourselves when we are seeking after God. So what, is, what, what does it mean, uh, Bill? What exactly are you saying? Well, I started thinking of, in, in my fast, I need to be, like I said, praying. I need to be seeking God. I need to read his word as I do all the time, but, but I need to do it maybe more. Reducing some of the other things, and that's probably the purpose of fasting. And I know people that work a full-time job, and maybe 
in a secular sense that their job is not physical, it might not be as hard as for somebody that has a physical job and they're laboring harder. But it still doesn't stop us from at least when in, in this fast that we can still pray. We can pray when we're driving. Hallelujah, don't close your eyes unless you know the Holy Spirit has the wheel. Hallelujah. Some logic. I'm tagging on what uh, Matt said about medication. Use some logic in it. But if you know that the Holy Spirit said to let go of the wheel, because I've heard some stories before, and actually had the Holy Spirit told the person to let raise the wheel, you know what? And the Holy Spirit kind of turned the wheel for him. Hallelujah. When that happens, let go of the wheel. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> let go of the wheel. Hallelujah. <laughs> And so as we seek him, and we're fasting, and we're going through our daily life, and I think we're at day uh, 10 today, Wednesday, is that correct? Day 10. For me, I'm just using me as, as a uh, sounding board that I can't speak for another person, but hallelujah, the first three days that were difficult, I've, I've gotten past them. Thank you. Man. Hallelujah, yeah. God. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. As you kind of say, I turned the page one that way, right? A little different. Hallelujah. And so a scripture that came to mind for me was Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, and we read, For everything there is a season. And a time right. for every matter under heaven. And when I when I read that, and how late I need to drink uh, water. When I read that, it made me realize that my fast is different than for your fast, right? And it's different than your fast, and it's different than yours, Wade. And it's different than yours, Pat. Totally different. Maybe somebody, you know, uh, has to eat on a daily basis because they're taking medication. Hallelujah. And there might be people that are fasting 24 hours around the clock. Just water intake and hallelujah. And we know that Jesus fasted for 40 days. And we know Moses fasted for 40 days. And they then took nothing. <clears throat> I thought about that. It's like, wow. <clears throat> Help me, Lord. Help me in my fast. Yeah. Help me. Now I understand why this is here. <laughs> Help me, Lord. Thank you. And so each person's fast is different. What I really want to draw towards is the fasting and the praying. And I thought about uh, Tuesday night prayer service here and Friday night prayer service here. Hallelujah, Lord God. That I, I, I see people that, that they come. And I see them on the altar. And I see women of God. They go back there and they grab a prayer cloth. I guess that's the right name, right? Prayer. Okay. And they put it over themselves. And they're here. And I hear people's voices. And sometimes you can't hear anything they're saying. And then sometimes... You hear their voice. And sometimes you hear the audible word that they're speaking out, that they're praying to their Heavenly Father. And sometimes you hear people in their prayer language from heaven, their prayer language from heaven. And it's so sweet to the ears to hear that. 
And sometimes there's music on, and sometimes there's praise and worship, but I think about these things, and I think about the people that come here as intercessory prayer warriors. Mm. Hallelujah. That they come here to pray. And they come here to pray for others. They come here to pray for the church. They come here and pray for the pastor, and they pray for people in the congregation, and they lift people up, and they lift up events. Hallelujah, Lord. That there's power yep. when we come together Amen. as a group of people. And I have seen times here that the Spirit of God is moving And the Spirit of God can also move among his people and not to take away from the worship team at all. But the Spirit of God can move in whatever manner he wants to. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so we see these people that come here and pray and hallelujah, Lord God, that you brought these people together. Yes. And I look out and I, and I say, are there more, Lord? Yes. And the answer to that is yes. That they're, they're here. And they're going to be coming through the door. And they're going to walk into this door. And they're going to have a seat in the sanctuary. And God's going to change events. And it's going to grow in its time. Hallelujah. And so... Be a good cheer that if this isn't your season to fast 24-7 with nothing but water or juice, but your season is to fast right now from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or some other different uh, assortment of time or, or, or maybe even a different fast, whatever it might be. Hallelujah. That you're joining in this proclamation, yes. this fasting, hallelujah, of Crossways Ministries, hallelujah. And so then I wrote down a few things, and 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 uh, actually this first one here is is not my thing. But I, when I read it and I, and I thought about fasting and praying, it was like, wow, that really resonated in me. And it said, by fasting, the body learns to obey the soul. And I thought about Matt's illustration of the circle. And on the top part of the circle was the body, the flesh. And then we moved down into the soul and into the spirit. And I thought, wow, the soul. <clears throat> Obeying the soul. Hallelujah. By praying, the soul learns to command the body. That self-discipline that is sometimes and oftentimes very hard. Fasting is a spiritual discipline, a demonstration of our humility, our dependency on God, just like Ezra. He brought the people together as a group and they depended on God for the journey and for the events that they would go through, for setting up their tents, for defending them. And we read it over and over, God's protection, hallelujah, supernatural protection. So fasting and praying is a way to humble ourselves before God. Psalms 35, 13, and we read, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing sackcloth, and I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. Hallelujah. So seeking God for direction was one of my 
directions of this fast and prayer. For guidance, seeking God's presence, seeking God's face. And the, there's a, a scripture I'm going to go to here, and it actually is in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. That's 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. And most of anything that I'm reading scripturally is all coming out of the uh, KJV. And so if you're, if you're reading the ESV or some other uh, little translation, I'm sure it's going to be very close. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and they turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I'll forgive them, take away their sin, their sin, and will not and will heal their land. And so I look at this word face, and I went and looked it up, and, I, and I'm one of the guys that it takes me under normal circumstances of study. <clears throat> that Second Chronicles seven fourteen, it would would have took me at least eight hours to have gone through that. Call me slow, call me what you want. It, would, it takes me longer. I take and I dissect them words, and I splice and I dice them, and I relook at them backwards and forwards. I'm uh, some people probably wonder what's going on with that strange old man there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. So the word face, the transliteration, and because uh, I use the uh, Blue Letter Bible, and I'm not selling the Blue Letter Bible, by the way. I'm not a salesman for, and there's probably a few people that can use them, but I know uh, the pastor of the church has been using. All the uh, Charles Street. Hallelujah. I got on there and tried to use it. And uh, sometimes it's difficult when you're making a transition. And if anybody remember the computer world, when they had Lotus 1, 2, 3. Anybody remember Lotus 1, 2, 3? Okay. I was going to say, if you do, you have to be definitely in your 60s. Okay. Anyhow, it was a program. <laughs> And so what, what I'm trying to say is I, I use Blue Letter Bible for uh, my study stuff. And so this word face, when you bring it back into, uh, well, the pronunciation is Pawneem, P-A-W-N-E-E-M. And so when you bring it back and you uh, do the word search for it in the strong courts or whatever you might use, it actually signifies God's presence. So when we say we are seeking the face of God, we're looking for God's presence to manifest yes. itself. And so when we're here and we're praying, we're looking for the manifestation, right? Yeah. I'll leave. So in Genesis, and I'm going to uh, run through this a little more rapidly uh, because my intention was to get out here at 8.30, not 11 o'clock. And uh, my wife reminded me of that. <laughs> the word face is significant in a key theme that weaves through the word of God. In Genesis, when mankind sinned against God and was removed from the garden, Genesis 3 and 23, we read, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. And then we read in 3a, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God, hallelujah, the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. So focusing back on the word presence, we should be seeking God's presence when we are fasting. When we pray, we are communicating with God. We engage in loving fellowship with our creator, the maker of heaven and earth. In Philippians 4, 6, we read, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Hallelujah. If, if uh, we're still going to do some. We can close out. Hallelujah. So if you want to come up and uh, help us close out, please. 
And in Philippians 4, 7, we read, And the peace of God, which it passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. That your presence, Lord God, that you manifested your holy presence in this sanctuary, yes. Lord God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord God, for the open heaven, Lord God. For the words, Lord God, for the prayer, Lord God, for praying for each other, Lord God. Ask, Lord God, that you move in each and every one of our lives, Lord God. That you help us, Lord God, as we, if we are in that season, Lord God, help us to co continue, Lord God, in our fast, Lord God. Help us to continue in our prayer, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, continue reading your holy word, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. We thank you. For all that you do, Lord God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord God. We thank you that you're moving upon this house of faith, Lord God. Yes. And I pray each and every person, yes. hallelujah. And I thank you, Lord God, that we continue to seek your face. Yes. Hallelujah. Your presence, Lord God, in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.